Last week, uh, we looked at Psalm 51. We're going to continue to look at Psalm 51 uh, here this morning. So if you want to be turning there, if you haven't already turned there, to Psalm 51. And we looked at uh, Psalm 51, 1 through 6. And we really were kind of honing in on the idea of what do we want from God? Uh, we have so many things that we desire in this life. And a lot of the, those things will come into uh, thoughts of uh, material things, the things we want a good home, we might uh, physical things, we might want a good family, a, a good uh, place to live, a good job. And those things are not bad things to desire or want or even pray for uh, from God. But as we see in Psalm 51, we see here a man who has been devastated by his own sin. He has been devastated by... Uh, the, the sin of murder. He has been devastated by the sin of adultery. And he is, he, his conscience is full. It is actually overflowing with guilt. And he understands that he can only come to God for that forgiveness. And so we looked at that and we saw time after time. Uh, let me get here to Psalm 51 uh, myself and then uh, pick up my uh, reading glasses. Psalm 51, and I want us to notice as we look through here, the continual uh, question or, or statement of asking uh, from David to God to, to cleanse him. You can really tell how much the gravity of his situation is, is destroying him. So in verse 1, he starts out, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to your greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgression." Purge me of my transgressions. He's going to use that uh, again in a later verse that we're going to look at this morning. And he says, wash me thoroughly and cleanse me from my sin. He says, I know my transgressions are before me. My sin is ever before me. It is the stain that I cannot get rid of. It is a constant reminder in my, uh, in my life. And he knows that against God and him alone, he has done this. He knows that while he has sinned against uh, Bathsheba, he has sinned against Bathsheba's husband and sin, sinned against uh, his other people and actually brought in part of his, his general to uh, in the deception of the sin and his lying. He knows that first and foremost, he has sinned against God. And so he, he says, God, you're justified in your judgment towards me, that judgment that came through Nathan. And then in verse five, behold, here is, here is how David feels because of he's guilt ridden uh, here his conscience is guilt ridden and so he thinks that he's just been around sin his entire life and he can't get away from it so verse 5 behold I was brought forth in iniquity and in my sin my mother conceived me and behold here he comes to an important conclusion behold you desire truth in the innermost being you don't desire lust you don't desire sin you don't desire the guilt but what you do desire is truth to be in me. And so David is realizing and, and wants this as well. And in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. In the hidden part, in the part that only God can see. The part that only God can see. And we saw, we made that connection to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, where God says, or Paul says through God, or God says through Paul, there. That he wanted a people, he chose us in him, in Christ, to be holy and blameless before God. And that word there before has that idea that God is looking right down inside of us. And so we stand there before God and God is able to see through our skin, see through uh, our, ourselves and know exactly what's in our soul. And David knows that. And so David wants to be completely cleansed of that. So what he sees is a holy and blameless person before him. And fortunately, God knew that's what we would need and ultimately what we would want. We would want to stand before God holy and blameless. And this is what David wants. So we're going to pick up here in verse 7, this continual idea. Again, David has been devastated by his sin. He has been devastated. And I think that too much in this world today, we are not devastated by our sins. We're not devastated. We don't understand the gravity of our sins. And oftentimes we just justify what we do. We justify what we do rather than accepting it and being accountable for our sins. We just justify our actions in hopes that we can kind of get around it. 
And this is what the world is doing today. And we're living in the world in this, in our culture today that is justifying sin. And actually what they're doing is saying, it's not sin anymore. It's my opinion. If my opinion is mine, then it's right to me. And they're completely changing what God has called that which is sinful. And so we are being brought into this idea. We're being affected by this, brethren. To where we don't understand the gravity and the devastation of sin in our lives. And so we need to be reminded here of what David is going through. And that is something that we should be in a similar vein going through ourselves. Understanding the devastation of sin. So he says, purify me with hyssop. And so now we have this idea, this scene of a priest that is going to come and cleanse uh, cleanse. Uh, someone who has been, uh, in one case, uh, they used, would use uh, hyssop for leprosy. And the priest would come and he'd apply with the hyssop. The hyssop was an herb that also did have medicinal uh, elements to it as well. And they would apply that water or the blood upon the person, the leprosy, and try to cleanse them and to clean them. And they would have to go and be outside of the camp for a while until their leprosy was cleansed. They'd come back in and then they would have that blood or that water applied to them to show that they were officially cleansed and able to come back into uh, the camp or into uh, the temple at that time. And so David is asking and telling God, I need you to be my priest. I need you to cleanse me. I need you to purify me. And an interesting thing about this word purify is that it has within it the Hebrew root word for sin. And so we could actually say, David is saying, desinitize me, completely rid me of sin. I don't want any stain at all. You know, we uh, have had a hard time finding Clorox bleach wipes, right? You know, in this time, they have been completely wiped out, no pun intended, uh, and we cannot find them anywhere. And it says at the bottom, it says at the bottom of those Clorox bleach wipes, right? Able to get rid of, how, how, what's the percentage? 99 not yet. Everybody knows it, right? Because that, that 0.1%, you know, man, if, if someone gets some virus, some disease, they're, they're covered there. But it gets 99.9%. Well, David is saying, I want you to completely desanitize me from my sin. I don't want any stain. I don't want any blemish. I don't want anything left over, God. Please purify me completely from the sin that's in my life. Notice how David is going on and on and on. You know, and some people today might look at this and go, gosh, David, you, sh you know, can you get over it? You know, David, you're going on, you know, wash me, cleanse me. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, my transgression sins ever before me. Uh, purify me, wash me. Again, we see this idea in, 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 the next, in this part of seven. Wash me, make, me heart, make my heart to uh, hear joy and gladness. But David, we're reminded, is a man after God's own heart. And so it is something that we want to be like. We want to, Now, we need to also understand that, that David doesn't want to stay here in this guilt. Right? He doesn't want to wallow in this. He wants rid of it. He wants rid of it. Okay, so then he says, you know, wash me and I shall be whiter in snow. And an interesting thing about this, uh, this word snow uh, is there is this small little um, possibility, the definition you see in the definition of the snow that has the idea of shining. You know, and, and we are blessed to be able to live in an area uh, that has snow. Uh, now, you know, some of you are like, no, keep the snow up in the mountains. I want the green down here so I can golf. Uh, well, you know, I'm not talking about someone specific, am I? Uh, but, you know, we love, we love, I love the snow. I love after it snows at, at, at night. And then isn't it an amazing thing that at night, when you go out and you see the snow, what actually happens at night? It's, it's actually brighter, isn't it? Then a normal night, when you go and you see snow, the white there, the snow actually kind of, kind of brightens up the night. And if the moon is out... Oh man, if the moon is out, you open up the shades, you know, and, and a bright light comes in the reflection from the snow. It's really bright out. And so David is saying, make me whiter than snow. David wants to shine for God. He, as we'll see here later in the, in the, the passage in two weeks, when we look at the next thing, part of this, this, this sermon series that we're looking at. But 
He wants to be whiter than snow because he knows, he has in his mind, that's, that's the whitest thing, the cleanest thing that I can see. The purest thing that I can see is, is the whiteness of snow. So I want to be that clean. I want to be that clean, but I also want to shine. And so David, it's the contrast between what he feels with the stain of sin versus that which he wants to be cleansed from his sin and be made uh, white, whiter than snow. Then look at verse 8. Verse 8 uh, is an amazing verse to me. I mean, all these verses are pretty amazing to me. But have you ever prayed to God in such a way where you said, God, do whatever you need to do? You know, it, I had a, a, an instructor, at, a professor at my school at Bear Valley, and he was, we were doing a preacher in his work, and he said, you know what, gentlemen, I, I prayed this prayer once, and, and I almost regretted it. He said, I, I prayed, God, wear me out in your service. Wear me out in your service. He's like, and I, you know, he's like, and I wasn't just giving God lip service. I was really telling, you know, I was, I was young, and I was ready, and I was like, God, wear me out in your service. And he says, guess what he did? That year, he wore me out in his service to the point where I almost quit. When David says here, make me to hear joy and glad, he's saying, when he says make me, he is telling God, do whatever you need to do so that I can hear joy and gladness again. And that joy and gladness is coming from the forgiveness of my sins. That's going to be the result of that. But he's saying, God, I want you to do whatever it takes. I'm prepared. And I don't know that sometimes that we're prepared to make those kind of statements and prayers. God, do whatever you need. Well, do whatever you need so that I can know and be in your good grace again. Because we might be afraid of what we might need to lose David knows that there's nothing more important than his relationship to God. That it may cause him to lose something. But he's, telling, he's telling God, do whatever it takes. We need to be prepared to make those same, same statements and prayers to God ourselves. Understanding that it may help us in our relationship with God. And so ultimately, we see here, uh, here in this next verse, let the bones which you have broken rejoice. David is so overwhelmed by the guilt of his sin, that his sin is permeating his life, that this is really talking about just the totality of what his sin is doing to him. It is in his inner body. It is breaking his body down. His bones are being broken. I had a, a friend of mine in elementary school that uh, we... He, uh, we came out of our house, or I came out of my house and looked down the street. We heard the sirens. We heard fire trucks. We heard police cars, ambulance. You know, and we walk out our door, as all kids do. You know, you want to see where they're going and what's going on. And, and down in the corner there, there, the street wrapped around, and that was there by my school. And there was a huge truck, diesel trailer truck that was down there, along with all of the ambulance and the, and the police and the, the firefighters that were all there. And we were wondering what was going on. And my Mom and dad wouldn't let me ride my bike down there to find out. Uh, but what we ended up finding out the very next day was one of my friends was hit by a truck while he was on his bike. He had fractured, several fractured ribs. He had a fractured pelvic bone. He had a fractured femur. Uh, femur. He had a fractured uh, humerus in his arm here. Uh, and when I saw him next, he was in a wheelchair in a full body cast with one leg sticking out, this head to toe. I, I don't even remember how many bones that he had fractured, but he lived. And David is, ex and he was in explicable, an explicable pain, my friend Raymond was. David, David is, is so hurt by his own sin, by his admission. That it's hurting to his core like his bones are broken. Anybody have a, ever had a broken bone? It hurts. <laughs> I've had a fractured rib and I've had a, a broken foot. I can't imagine Raymond and all those uh, the bones that he's fractured. 
but David, again, trying to explain and emphasize how he is feeling. He's saying, my bones have been broken. My bones, please let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my uh, iniquities. Earlier, if you go and you read in Psalm 11, verse 7, da written by David, David knows that only the upright, only the righteous are able to be seen by God, to be in his presence. It's just like we see in Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 4. He was going to have a people holy and blameless before him. David knows that only righteous people are going to be heard by God. That an only righteous person can stand before God. And so he also knows that the sins in which he has committed could also separate him from God. He understands that that's what sins do. And you can see that in the other Psalms that he's written. And so he's saying, hide your face. Don't look upon me, but cleanse me of my iniquities so that you can. So that you can. You know, one of the most difficult things for us to do when we've committed some sin or done something wrong is look into the eyes of the person that we've offended. Isn't that hard? You know, you, it's why, you know, when you, you call your kids in, you know, when they've, they've messed up, you know, and they know it, what do they usually come in? They come in looking down. Why is that? They don't want to see your eyes, your disappointed eyes. They don't want to see... Yeah, the reality of their situation. Well, David is saying, don't, don't, look, don't look upon me. Don't look upon me, but cleanse me from my iniquities, and then I do want you to look. Because I want you to see me cleansed. I don't want you to see me uh, riddled with, with sin, with my sin. So hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. And then in this next verse, Dave, David understands that not only is it going to take forgiveness, because ultimately David wants to be restored. David wants to have a relationship with God. He wants to be restored into that relationship with God uh, again. But he understands first it's going to take for, you know, forgiveness. And then he understands that it's going, to, it's going to need to take a changed heart. The heart is going to be, need to, made, to be made different. And so you have this word create, which in almost every single circumstance in the Old Testament, uh, save two that I found, but there are numerous other, it is the same word that's used by God to create. It's in the beginning, God created. That is the same word that he has here, created me a new heart. And God created them both, or both in his image. That is the same word. Create. And so in this verse alone, David knows that the only way that he is going to be able to have a changed heart, a renewed heart, a cleansed heart, is by God alone. He cannot do it himself. And so he's telling God himself, God, I need you to give me a new heart. A heart that's filled with your truth, with righteousness, not with sin, not with lust. But with the truth, with your righteousness, with your forgiveness, create in me a new heart. And then what he says here in the next verse is also uh, kind of parallel to what he says a little bit later in verse 12. But he says, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You know, sometimes what can happen with sin is sin can be so devastating that while we know that we are in our sin and we need that forgiveness, sometimes it is difficult for us to move on from it. It can be difficult. We can be so bogged down by the sin in our lives and the guilt of it that we ask for forgiveness of sins, but we are so downtrodden because of it that it is difficult for us to move on from it. And so David is saying, not only do I want you to create in me a clean heart, O God, but renew a steadfast spirit within me so that I can continue on after I have this new heart. You see, David also knows that it's not just something that we can go ask for forgiveness from God, uh, you know, for, for the sins in our lives and then kind of move right back into our old life. David understands that and realizes that. That not only... He's not only, God, do I want you to make me righteous, but then I want to continue to be righteous. 
That is the practical side of our righteousness, is God makes us righteous through the blood of his son, but then he wants us to practice righteousness and practice doing the right thing. And so David realizes that, but he also knows that he's going, he may be discouraged along the way. It's just like the, the passage that was read by Mike in Romans chapter 7. You know, Paul is obviously discouraged by his sin. The very thing that I know that I need to do, I don't do it. And the very thing that I'm not supposed to do, that's what I do. And he goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until finally he goes, but thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. And so that's what David realizes here that, that God, I want you to give me a new heart. I want you to forgive me. I want you to give me this new heart, but then help me to stay on track. Help me to stay on track. And isn't that a prayer that we need? Stay focused. Keep going. David understands this. And then here is the gravity of, of what sin can do. And, and David realizes it here in verse 11. He says, do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David knows that the sins in his life can take him and separate him from God. He knows that he is right there at this possibility. He says, don't take your Holy Spirit from me, which, which, which represented uh, God's presence. God's presence. You know, when we look back and you look back at 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16, what happens there is David receives the presence of the Holy Spirit, right? He is anointed with the Holy Spirit. But what does David also witness that I think, this is just my opinion, because we, we can't see it exactly in there. But I wonder if David, when he says, don't take your Holy Spirit from me, if he has something in his past in mind. Do you remember what happened there in 1 Samuel 16? After David received the Holy Spirit of God, who loses the Holy Spirit of God? Saul. Saul. The Holy Spirit of God is taken from Saul. And it's replaced with an evil spirit. And then David witnesses the deterioration of Saul. Saul, the great king of Israel. But he loses the presence of God. And he slowly, some we claim, and I think so too, he goes mad. He becomes crazy. David saw this and witnessed this and had his life uh, there uh, you know, in, in, in peril with Saul. I think that David saw that and says, I don't want any part of that, God. I don't want any part. I don't, please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Because he saw firsthand what happens to those who lose the presence of God. See, the difference between David and Saul is they both sinned, didn't they? You know, in some, from the human perspective, you might say, David's was worse. But what happened when Saul was confronted about his sin? What was Saul's response? He justified what he did, didn't he? He justified his actions. He came up with reasons as, well, why did I, this is why I did this, you know? And Samuel's like, oh, you sinned against God. Well, he justified. And that's what we do. That's what this culture does. It just justifies what we do because we can't do anything wrong. You know, pretty soon the word wrong is going to be, you know, it's already offensive, isn't it? We're going to have to get rid of that word too, guys. Let's get rid of the word wrong. That's what we're doing. And that's the way Saul acted. Nothing new under the sun. Centuries ago, Saul is justifying what his, his actions were after Samuel called him out in sin. But what did David do? What did David do when he was confronted with his sins? The first thing he realized, like, I sinned against God. He took ownership. He was accountable. He held himself responsible and accountable for what he did. That was the difference. 
so David says, please don't cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me because he knows here, verse 12, he wants to be restored so that he can have the joy of salvation. There are so many things in which we look for in this life for joy, for happiness. And God said, I've provided it to you with my presence in salvation. We look for so many things in this world. We're looking, you know, as, as the old song said, we're look, looking for love in all the wrong places. You know, we're looking for happiness in all the wrong places. Happiness and joy and love is found in God's presence, in his presence alone. Now, there's other things in which we can be happy for and, and have joy from it. And that's not to say that we're to shun those things. But don't, don't forget the fact of what brings you true joy and what David is desperately missing here. He thinks he's, he's, he, he doesn't want to lose this because he knows this and this alone is what brings him joy. And so don't allow all of our other worries, all of the other concerns, all those things consume you and overwhelm you to the point the fact that you forget that you have joy in God with a relationship with him that's what we should be striving for is our relationship with God every day and that sets the foundation for everything else in our life so he says restore me the joy of your salvation. Again, we see the same idea here uh, in this verse that we saw in verse 10. And sustain me with a willing spirit. One that will endure to do righteous things. Sustain me, God. So when I get up tomorrow and I'm facing difficulties again and I'm facing temptation again, God, sustain me. Sustain me to continue to do the right thing because I know ultimately, God, I do not want to lose my relationship with you. That's what I want. And God knows that's what we need. So we need to ask, just as we did last week, we need to ask our, ourselves again this question is, what do we want from God? That he hasn't already provided the very thing that we need. He's provided this. And so you turn with me to Ephesians. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter, to chapter 1 and we'll begin our lesson here. That was the introduction. Um, Ephesians 1. And again, I, I, I want to look at this verse again, verse chapter 3 and, and 4. And we'll get down to where I want to uh, get to our verse here. But we looked at Ephesians chapter 1 um, last week, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. There is not one thing that God has left out that he hasn't covered in what we need. And so we should look at these things and go, these are the things that I want. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. What is the first thing that David appeals to in Psalm 51? God's grace. God's grace. God, David knew that the only way that I'm going to receive this forgiveness is because of God's grace. That which I do not deserve. God's grace, according to his loving kindness, David says. So when did God know that we would need all these spiritual blessings? When did God know that we would need his grace? Before he created this world, he knew that we would need these things. And then ultimately, when we understand our relationship with God as David does, ultimately, it's the things that we want from him. 
that we desire from him. And so that he goes on here in verse 7, he says, In him we have redemption through his blood and for the forgiveness of our trespasses according, again, to the riches of his grace. David wants to be redeemed. He wants to be restored. He understands first that he must appeal to God's grace and his loving kindness. And then only next that is whether or not he receives that forgiveness of sins. He knows that he needs to be forgiven of his sins first before he is able to be restored and have a relationship with God again. And of course, God knew that that's what we would need. And that we would need the sacrifice of his son. That is the gravity of of sin, that it would take a sacrifice of his son on the cross for his blood to cleanse us from our sins so that we can be redeemed, that we can be bought back. You know, the idea of redemption in the ancient time, you might have two armies warring together and you'd have the victor of one king and the one king comes and he takes over the soldiers of, of uh, the defeated uh, kingdom and he brings them and he makes them slaves he brings them over and they make some slaves in his country. So the other king would come over and say, can I buy back my men? He would purchase them out of that slavery, redeem them, and bring them back. We become slaves to sin become slaves to sin and God sends his son so that we can be bought back. We can be redeemed. We can be restored again to the relationship that we should want with God. We need to be careful in the culture that we are living in, in this slippery slope that seems to be picking up speed, going away and further uh, and faster away from God's uh, word in our lifetime more than ever before. In our lifetime. We can't allow ourselves to get caught up in that. We must remember the devastation of sin. The gravity of sin. And what sin does. And be reminded of what David felt. And the only thing that he wanted to get back to. That's his focus. His focus 100% you see in Psalm 51 is getting himself cleansed and restored. And that should be our focus. And God promises that we will. That's the beauty of his grace. The gift of his grace. He says, I just want, just, you know, he, the problem with, with, with Israel is they never took ownership of their sins. They never acknowledged it. That's what God wanted. God says, just acknowledge your sins. Just tell me, I, I, yes, we've sinned against you, God, and I'll bring you back. I want so desperately to have you as my children again, as my people. You've done this, 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 and this. Eh, not really. No, we didn't. Just acknowledge. And so they got carried off into captivity. David, first thing, right after he finds out that he's the man. He says, I've sinned against God. And you see how much he's devastated in Psalm 51 by his concern about losing his relationship with God. How concerned are we about our relationship with God? So what do we want from God? He has already provided everything that we need. And I hope that when we look at that, we understand that God has provided everything that we need spiritually, that that is ultimately what we desire from him. And then everything else is just life as it comes, good and bad, but our rock is in our relationship with God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the preservation of your word that we can look into it. We can understand how to, uh, to know you, how to be saved, Father, how to be forgiven, uh, how to have a relationship with you, Father. We are so thankful that you have left for us uh, the example of David.
and that you've not left anything out with his life, that we can see very clearly that he was a, a sinful man, that he did some horrible things, Father. We're so thankful that you, that you showed us these things and that you allowed us into the heart of David to see the turmoil that he was going through, that, that sin can cause in our hearts and our soul. And I'm so thankful, Father, that you've shared that with us because I know that there are times where many of us have felt the same way. And many of us felt like potentially there's no way out of this. But Father, because we've seen your servant David and your King David be restored, we know that we can be restored as well, that we can be forgiven. And that joy and happiness and this gladness comes in being in a relationship with you. Father, you bless us so much. We thank you so much for the forgiveness of sins that we have. Father, we pray that you forgive us when we sin against you, when we transgress uh, the things you uh, wanted us to do, Father, when we make uh, and when we are led away by temptation, Father, help us, help us to be pricked, help us uh, to be uh, broken, to understand what sin does, and, and Father, help us to to always desire uh, to come back to you and to ask for that forgiveness that you so freely want to give to us, Father, so that we can continually remain uh, with you, Father, that that sacrifice of your Son continually cleanses us uh, from uh, our sins, Father, and uh, it just makes us understand also how great a sacrifice uh, Jesus is. Thank you so much for all that you do for us, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you are here this morning and, and you're struggling with sin and you want need and need to be restored and you want to ask God for forgiveness of sins, you can do that on your own in your own prayer, but maybe you'd like help. Maybe you would like strength and encouragement from your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's part of the reason why we're here in church, to bear one another up, to bear one another's burdens, to help each other, to admonish one another, to love one another. That's part of the work of the church. And I think sometimes that we forget that in these times. We just, we, we hold everything in just as David was doing. David was holding these things in and his heart was being hardened by it through this time. And that's what sin does to us. So if you're struggling with sin this morning, don't leave here before you ask for some prayers or pray here this morning. Let us stand and sing. Come we babble.